Welcome to The Geek in Review, the podcast focused on innovative and creative ideas in the legal profession. I'm Marlene Gaybauer. And I'm Greg Lambert. So Marlene, once again, you were on the road this week. and I was a road so warrior. <laughs> where, where were you this week? I was uh, in Washington, D.C. last week. And uh, actually before that, I was in Lubbock, Texas <laughs> for family <laughs> for family weekend and literally just came home from Lubbock and like took off for, for Washington. So literally in 24 hours, I'm in West Texas, I'm in Houston, and then I'm in Washington, D.C. So uh, I was there for work and uh, doing some listening sessions that went really, really well. So, But uh, I hear we have another Schwartz Greg. <laughs> yes, apparently this time in Los Angeles, we, we oh, had an, an no. attorney, or at least an attorney related to a firm that <laughs> had to explain <laughs> why there was a uh, brief submitted uh, to the court that had multiple made-up <laughs> citations, and uh, uh, their their excuse was, uh, sorry, didn't check it. So Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, I'm sure the judge is saying, sorry, doesn't cut it. Oh. Um, he hey. fined them nine hundred ninety nine dollars, one dollar short of of yeah. having to report it to the the yeah. state bar. Yeah. So if you you want to learn more, uh, Joe Patrice at the above the above the <laughs> law has a good uh, a good uh, article written in uh, Joe Patrice's real voice. So no AI was used there. I can tell. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe, thank you for keeping on top of those. Um, we are thrilled, Greg, to have with us today uh, Jacqueline Schaefer, founder and CEO of ClearBrief.ai, a company using AI to revolutionize legal writing. Jacqueline is an award-winning entrepreneur and a former litigator who saw firsthand the need for AI-powered tools to improve the accuracy and efficiency of brief writing. Yeah, since founding uh, ClearBrief in 2020, uh, the company has quickly become an industry leader, winning accolades like the 2023 Litigation Technology Product of the Year. So, Jackie, welcome to the Geek and Review. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. So, Jackie, you have a, a really impressive background as a litigator before making the leap uh, to to starting Clear Brief AI. Um, so, let me ask, let me ask you what and what originally inspired you to take your career in this new direction and start a company focused on AI to enhance legal writing and was there a particular moment or pain point in your own experience with brief writing that made you realize that, man, I, I really need to to create this kind of technology because I, I hate this this piece? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I'm not one of those entrepreneurs who is like, I hate practicing law. Like, I, I truly love the law. Um, I started out my career at Paul Weiss in New York as a litigator. I spent most of my career in government. Um, actually worked in in Alaska and Washington State, where I live now in in Seattle. Um, you know, as an assistant attorney general, so I had the chance to you know regularly brief and argue cases before you know the state appellate courts, um, many times before the Alaska Supreme Court. Um, really, just fun opportunities. But there was over and over that super stressful scramble that always happens, right? Like where I love the strategy and I love the the you know all of the thought that goes into um, writing the brief and synthesizing your arguments and the evidence. And then there's just kind of like a nightmare before you get things filed where you have all these little details that the scramble, way, <laughs> the scramble. it's just like a terrible scramble. And you, you know, it all actually sort of related back to the citations was one kind of insight that I had where not only are you site checking and, you know, checking everything over around the the law, the facts, you also have to do any exhibits. You have to do the table of authorities. You have to sometimes, you know, do hyperlinks, which is becoming now more and more common. Um, so that was a big kind of insight I had about the problem. Um, but I had a really formative experience actually um, before I started the company. I was living in, um, you know, Seattle at the time, and I was working on my first um, pro bono asylum case. And I was representing a mom and her toddler, um, where the stakes were, you know incredibly high. Um, basically, if we lost, they would be sent back to Honduras and likely murdered. So that was terrifying to honestly, to walk into that final hearing, you get sort of like uh -huh. one shot. And I'd written a massive brief, like a 50 page brief. Um, and I, you know, was trying to weave together the evidence that we had. But for the moment that we walked in, the judge was extremely grumpy. 
And just, you know, actually the first thing he said was, you're pregnant, you know, to my client. And just, it was just not a good vibe. Um, and so as the lawyer, you're just like, oh no, we're going to lose. He hates us kind of thing. Um, but there was a moment during, during the hearing where, you know, I pointed him to one of the pieces of evidence that I had written about in the brief, which was, uh, like a declaration by, um, medical professional. And he read the evidence, he read that declaration and he changed his mind and he believed my client and we won and he, and he granted them asylum. And so that was just like an amazing moment and something that I'd seen many times and experienced of how the evidence can really, that is what makes the difference. You can, you know, it's not about my advocacy. It's about putting the evidence in front of that judge and letting it speak for itself. Um, and so that is at the heart of actually what Clear Brief does is that it keeps the evidence visible while during the writing process, during the editing, during the the filing. And you can actually, you know, file a fully hyperlinked document that you read it side by side. We call it like a clear brief <laughs> because you can read, you know, the PDF of your your pleading and every single source is clickable and visible. So that is accomplished with AI. Um, and but that's that was the driving force behind starting the company. I'm glad that uh, that you that you changed the judge's mind on that one. And that uh, that was an experience that that led you to to develop the company. Um, Clearbase uses AI to analyze legal documents and provide suggestive evidence, and provide suggested evidence and citations to support legal arguments. Can you explain more about this technology and its key capabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things that we all start with when we're working on any kind of legal writing. So it's not just briefs, it's, you know, motions, um, memos, um, even outlines. And I'll talk about one of our new generative AI features in a second that is for um, developing a chronology. But basically you have a mess of evidence and it, it is your mission <laughs> to take this giant jumble of, you know, there, there's all sorts of different types of documents. There's emails, there's, you know, um, if it, depending if it's a real estate case, lease agreements, there might be transcripts, depositions, expert testimony, and you have to weave it together into something coherent and credible. So with Clearbrief, it's a Microsoft Word add-in. So that was one of my other insights of, in building AI, which at the, you know, it's funny because like a couple of years ago in, in 2020, people thought that was kind of like dinky, like, oh, something that sits beside you in Word and, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, and now it's like everyone's trying to to build yeah. the technology as a, as a word add-in. Um, but, you know, as litigators, we are in Word. That's the one piece of technology we like really know how to use. <laughs> um, so you click a button and it splits the screen in Word. <laughs> and then you drag in all of your sources. And we have different integrations. So it's easy to bring those, you know, right in from your case management system, from your e-discovery. And then you can just write and use our add fact site button, which was something I thought of when I was an associate, honestly, where you know how like the partner would be editing a draft and just put like a bunch of additional stuff in the in the brief. And you're like, where did you get this? <laughs> I don't think this is true. <laughs> you don't know if this exists. So you can select any text in your Word document and you click the add fact site button and your briefs AI will suggest you pages from across all of those different documents that could best support what you've written. So it's kind of spoon feeding you the evidence. And by the way, you could also drag in your opponent's brief. Clear brief converts that into a Word doc, and then you can use those same features to find contradictory evidence to what they might have included the one favorable quote from that deposition. The AI will find you all the other places in the depositions that talk about that that concept. Um, and then you can insert a hyperlink to that page of where that was found. Um, and so it it stays with you and anyone else who's editing this or if the if the partner is looking at this draft, um, I have this imaginary partner still like haunting me. <laughs> Sounds like what I'm telling this. Um you know, but that is that is really a big part of, I think, how we're also meeting the moment of where law firms are in terms of AI, that 
the number one commandment of any law firm that is, um, you know, starting to use AI is you have to review the output. You have to review everything. You have to check over every single thing. And just like that, you know, horror story you just told at the beginning of the podcast about um, the attorney, you know, the latest attorney who just put something that an AI had generated into his brief. The partners want to be sure that they can see all of the sources and, you know, just verify that you didn't hallucinate something. <laughs> One more aspect of the brief that you is know, no, really go ahead. taking off. So um, we have a new generative AI feature that, again, you drag in all of that mess of documents that you got from the client and click a button and literally it takes seconds and Clear Brief's instant hyperlinked timeline will boom. It will put a chart in your Word document that has every date extracted from the document, including like implicit dates. So if a witness was like, well, yesterday I was walking down the street and then, um, you know, I saw something happen and then today, blah, blah, blah. It will put those dates in from yesterday and today into your into your timeline. It will include a description that the AI generates of what happened that comes directly from your documents. So it's not hallucinated. But then this is the important part. It has that hyperlinked citation in the right hand column so that you can verify where <laughs> it got that date, where it got that summary. But it's done for you. Um, we had a user tell us like last week, he was like, this saved me an entire day's work. <laughs> I can't believe like this is amazing. Um, and, and often it's like that non billable type work where you're not going to bill for all those hours you spent sort of tracking down, you know, the dates and the documents and um, you're going to bill for that, you know, high level analysis that you've that you do of that information. Talk to us a little bit more about the the mm -hmm. chronology and um, I'll, I'll go ahead and and since you since you got into the uh, hallucinations, um, how is it that you can use the generative AI to pull that out and use that that amount of creativity but then not and then but also not hallucinate at this at the same time because I think that's one of the biggest fears that most firms have is um, you know they love they love the idea of the creativity but there's certain things they don't want it to be creative on so how, how do you strike that balance yeah that's a great question so I think at this point a lot of uh, lawyers have probably played around with like GPT-3, right? Like the free version of chat GPT that's like available online um, where you could ask it to you know, like write me um, a brief opening, you know, <laughs> fact section about a car accident in the style of Taylor Swift or like, you, you know, you can have it kind of do these different, you know, spit out different um, types of writing. I'd like to see that. And <laughs> it would be quite entertaining. Um, the problem is that it is drawing on, you know, um, information from the Internet. It's kind of drawing on patterns of language to just sort of make up something that sounds like it will meet those, uh, you know, parameters that you set. Um, it doesn't have a, you know, finite sandbox of data. It's pulling from like anything ever written on the Internet. Um so it could be, you know, something that you could over a few drafts, keep editing and editing to get it closer to reflect the reality of your secure, confidential, you know, record in the case. Um, but that's a lot of work and it's probably more work than just doing right, doing it yourself at that point. So with Clear Reef, though, you have a, you have a right. sandbox. So b by uploading your, you know, those discovery documents that only information in the record can be, you know, provided to the court, right? So um, our AI is trained to just stick within that <laughs> those boundaries. Um, we're still using the power of the large language models um, that, you know, weave together language in a way that sounds better than, you know, maybe your average first year associate. Like, um, so we're, we're using the great things about um, generative AI and the power of its ability to write fluidly, but we're limiting it to just the information that the court can actually consider. Um, and I think one other related point is just that 
um, it's not easy to build a company that can, you know, that lawyers can trust with their data. So when ChatGPT first came out, there were all these different apps that were like, lawyers, just put your data in here and do this and that. And and there were very questionable, you know, security planners. And yeah. um, we have built ClearBrief really from day one. We, we're SOC 2 Type 2 certified, which means we meet the strictest security confidentiality requirements in the industry. And we're audited on all of that by a third party. Um, so that's why we are used by hundreds of law firms across the country, including big law, including courts and government agencies. Um, and now we're actually starting to be used by um, major law firms in Europe as well, which is really cool. Um, but they also have extremely stringent requirements. Um, so Ooh. it's, you know, you can definitely harness the power of your documents, but you have to make sure that the product that you use is designed to safely handle them in the way that lawyers need data to be treated. Okay. Well, you you announced recently that uh, ClearBrief has uh, integrations with Relativity and iManage. So why are integrations important and, and what other and what other platforms are you planning on integrating with? Yeah. Um, so integrations were something that were really um, driven by our customers um, asking us for them. <laughs> so um, we started actually with Clio. So, um, and I'm super proud. We won best new app in 2022 for our integration that we built with Clio um, because we started out by serving solo and small firms and we still, they're, you know, um, a really important customer group for us. So um, then we started working with with larger firms, um, iManage, um, NetDocs, Relativity. Those are, you know, for e-discovery and those are the systems that they tend to use. So um, we built those integrations as well. And what's cool is that, you know, it's actually not something that any company can just get an integration going. It, it is a partnership where those companies have to trust mm -hmm. the company. Um, so mm -hmm. it took it took a while to build our, you know, credibility as a small, scrappy startup um, to get those partnerships. So I'm really proud of that. Um, but it just makes it really seamless for uh, lawyers to bring in, you know, their case documents. And the way that they think about this at firms is that when you get all of this information from your client, you are sort of dumping it somewhere where you want that to be like, this is our repository of everything. It's like the junk drawer of the case, right? Like, so we can prove we got this on this date. We have every single item. When you're, you're sitting down to write about something, you don't necessarily want every single thing in the kitchen sink. You've narrowed it down to... Um, you know, in maybe during the e-discovery process or just your own um, initial review that like there might be, um, you know, 5,000 PDFs that you want <laughs> out of the 10,000. Mm -hmm. You can bring in everything too and declare brief, but um, that's how our users sort of think about those integrations with their case management system. Um, so we do have some really exciting integrations coming up. I can't announce them yet, but I really want to. Um, but um, we are... Let's just say that. Uh, go ahead. It's just just between they us do. and a few hundred people, I'm sure. <laughs> um, they won't yeah, tell. But let's just say the, you know, we, for example, one of the things that we currently do is we not only bring in your factual sources, but anytime you cite to a case or a statute or regulation, we automatically display that. And so we have a partnership with FastCase that allows us to display case law. You don't have to log in to any of these tool to, to fast case or anything like that will just it just displays it automatically um so we're bringing in even more you know legal content um so that's one of our our upcoming um integrations that um hopefully i can announce soon um yeah and is, is that even if you don't have a license for for fast case correct you still get the access yeah you still it'll just pop okay. right up so that's um, one of the also really popular things people do with with our tool is when you get a brief from opposing counsel, drag it in, Clear Brief does its, you know, AI analysis and any citation that they've referenced, it will just display the law. So you can read their brief at the same time as you read the case or the statute. And I love that because I always had this moment of panic when I get opposing counsel's writing where you're like, oh my God, their case is airtight. Like <laughs> We're going to lose. Everything is like, oh, my God, they've laid it out so well. And then you go and read 
<laughs> what they've citing are like, oh no, they just made that up. The case does not say that. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> oh, wait a minute. The documents have nothing to do with what they're arguing. Like, so the quicker you can get to that moment of relief of like checking the sources, that's, you know, it's helping with, with our clients' uh, anxiety as well. <laughs> yeah. So I'm I'm curious, I mean, given the fact that this is, you know, sort of new technology, it impacts workflow, um, it, you know, it may, you know, it impacts the way lawyers do their work. Um, you know, how receptive have, have law firms been to adopting, um, you know, AI writing tools like ClearBrief? And, you know, what are the challenges that you're seeing um, as regarding adoption that, that you're working to overcome? Yeah, so I will say there has been kind of like a sea change in the last, you know, six months <laughs> to a year where um, our initial customers, early customers were folks who were really on the, you know, the cutting edge and, you know, understood early on about, you know, technology and the advantage it gives them. Um, and then I feel like most of the legal profession is waking up to that. And so it's become um, way easier, basically, to we we do, we show clear brief um, to a room of litigators and they're like, okay, give it to me now. Like I want it. Um, <laughs> I want to try it. I want to use it. Um, because what they're hearing is that, mm -hmm. you know, AI is going to transform legal, but often when they see products that are a little open-ended, it's sort of like, you can do anything with this AI, ask it anything, do anything. Mm -hmm. It's too abstract for a lot of lawyers and litigators who are like, look, I have my way that I do my writing and um, I'm not going to like chat with a robot about it right now, <laughs> like, you know, so I think where we've succeeded in kind of meeting this moment is we were ready because, you know, I started the company in, in, you know, 2020. So we've been working on AI. We have four issued AI patents that cover our unique technology. Like we were ready for this moment. So when they see clear brief, it's not just a kind of blank slate of AI. It's very tailored to the workflows that they have. Um, so it feels um, comfortable in a way to them. It's in Word. Um, it's been, we've put a lot of thought and effort into making it a part of what they already do instead of AI's here, change everything. Um, that's too overwhelming for most um, lawyers and most law firms. Now I do see sometimes a bit of a gap between, um, especially at bigger firms, um, what the leadership of the firm maybe wants versus the people who are in the trenches. So I do see, you know, the associ the newer associates, the paralegals. Um, we have tons of paralegal users and, you know, um, first year associate users of Clear Brief, and they love it. And they love being able to get access to new technology. Um, so I think if if I could give one piece of advice, honestly, to the, the leaders of the law firms is, um, you know, you're by dragging your feet and like taking a long time to give your your um, frontline, you know, <laughs> uh, associates access to AI, you are disadvantaging your firm and honestly their growth as new lawyers in a profession that is changing, you know, dramatically day by day. So the sooner you can get AI into their hands, let them experiment. Of course, it has to be a trusted tool. It has to have the proper security. Like there's no question about that. But um, sitting back on the sidelines and waiting is going to, you know, hurt your firm in the long term. So that's that's sort of where sometimes I see um, a little bit of a um, a challenge. I'm curious. I mean, have any kind of arguments come up in terms of the billable hour and how this would impact the billable hour? Has that been a roadblock? Yeah, so that's so funny. So when I started fundraising um, for Clear Brief, you know, I um, I have raised, you know, VC capital, one of the the two percent of women who <laughs> have raised VC capital. Um, those statistics are are really exciting. Yay! Um, <laughs> yes, um, the VCs I... ha always ask yeah. about that, and what's interesting to me is that I don't really hear that from lawyers and from the customers. Like, I don't think that's how they think about their work. There are just some tasks in litigation that you just don't want to do it. It doesn't matter what you're getting paid or, you know, like I do not want to spend, you know, eight hours 
just combing through like these massive, massive transcripts and trying to spot dates and my eyes are tired and I'm maybe missing things, I'm missing dates. Um, or we, our platform also does an instant table of authorities. It instantly compiles mm -hmm. your exhibits based on your citations. So that like that that scramble that we were talking about earlier where it's just so stressful. Like I don't care if I'm getting paid, you know, or if if I am billing, I could bill eight hours doing a table of authorities by hand. I don't want to do that. That is not how I want to spend my life. I can still bill that time if I do, if I use AI to do something faster, I can still spend hours um, analyzing and actually like the, the best insights I usually find for my writing happen when I've written the whole thing. Usually it actually happens after I file it, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, I think for most people, <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, those, yeah. hours, <laughs> those hours that you have, um, you know, in the final days before filing something, you can you can do a lot of um, really crisp rewrites. You can add some really great analysis. You're still going to be able to bill. Um, so I think another interesting dynamic I've pointed out, um, I've seen it happen a lot at Big Law is when you are um, when the partner sends the draft to the paralegal to do the table of authorities to do the exhibits they have to stop writing they cannot bill that entire day sometimes it takes like two days or if it's a really big like motion for summary judgment there's a million exhibits and moving parts it can take like a week to do this by hand and um now, if if you know that they're using AI and that it'll take seconds to do that table of authorities, it'll take seconds to pull your exhibits into a nice PDF for filing, um, you can keep writing and billing extra days. <laughs> so that is um, an interesting dynamic that it doesn't always shake out the way we think with AI. Yeah, it's kind of a shift in how, in how and where you bill. Exactly. Yep. And, and I agree on the, I, I do the same thing when I have arguments with my wife is about two days later, I figure, oh, what I should have said was what this. Was this? And, and so, <laughs> so, See, only you um, have a So Jackie, box. now this is how I've stayed married for 30 years, so is, is by not winning those. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so you, and you kind of touched on it just now, but I wanted to point out something that I've seen in your writing and heard in your talks, and that is, You've spoken about the need for lawyers to trust but verify when using AI tools like ClearBrief. So do you mind expanding a little bit about what you mean when, when you tell groups of people about being about trusting but verifying the AI tools? Yeah, absolutely. So again, I think that there's a, a um an interesting dynamic when when you use um generative AI to write an entire, you know, paragraph or document for you where we can sort of gloss over what has been the gloss over the output. Um, similar, I've actually, I, I struggle with this when I review something that someone else has written. I often miss mistakes when I'm reading something that someone else wrote. Um, it's just hard. It's hard to catch those things. And so that really, that is the point of why we have citations in our legal documents is so that um, we don't, you know, believe anything that's put in, <laughs> in a legal document unless we can check the source, scrutinize that source, validate it. Um, so I think that there is an inherent sort of challenge with um, generated writing for if you're going to actually use it for anything significant, like filing it with the court or even giving it to a client as a memo or an analysis. Um, site checking is has to become like even more easy and just a part of every single person on the team's um, routine um, because at any stage of the process, somebody might be using, you know, generative AI and inserting something into the document and then you could wind up, you know, horribly embarrassed and above the law, right? Like <laughs> you don't want that to happen. So I think that's part of um, the thoughtfulness really behind um, ClearBrief and its design is that um, even our generative AI, every single thing it's generating, you can see and validate it um, and make sure that it does actually say what you want it to say. But it's also easy to do that. So there's other tools like um, I believe CoCounsel does this where they will 
um, they will kind of like open up a PDF of where that, you know, something that, that it generated has come from. And you have to go and, you know, scroll and kind of try to figure out where in the PDF it said that. Um, but the problem is the other people who are reviewing your work might not have access to that PDF. It might be in, you know, the e-discovery system and the partner doesn't have access. They don't, they don't do that, right? Like, so that is really how we've built ClearWave so that all along the way, everyone who lays eyes on this document can see and scrutinize the source. And it has to be easy. Otherwise, you know, it, it may not happen, that level of scrutiny that you need when using generative AI. So we, we've talked a little bit about um, ClearBrief's extensive capabilities. Uh, uh, you know, what's, what other pain points in legal writing are you looking to solve with AI right now? What's on the horizon? Yeah, these are some good questions here. Uh, <laughs> um, we have actually some really <laughs> exciting um, features. We, we had the AI write them. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> They're quite good. Um, so, yes, we actually have some really big feature <laughs> announcements um, coming soon. But basically, um, just to give a quick preview, um, that, you know, that uh, instant chronology that I mentioned, there's a lot of different things that you might want to do once you have the chronology of what happened in the case, description of it, and the link to where the evidence is. There's a lot of different legal tasks you might want to do with that um, vetted, you know, reviewed, <laughs> uh, accurate, you know, chronology. So we are really building on that. And um, what's cool about that feature is that you don't need to know how to do anything really. Um, in ClearBrief, you could just click a button and it will give you a really, really helpful work product. Um, so that's kind of where we're where we're headed. Our platform is, is has a lot of different capabilities um, and. We're also um, building and expanding on our tools for paralegals um, because paralegals are, you know, just absolutely like overwhelmed and stressed too <laughs> in the legal profession. And um, we've what's great is that we really, um, you know, develop our roadmap um, based on what our customers are asking us for. And we kind of hear enough of a consensus that everybody wants this this new feature so then that's really what sets our um our vision and our roadmap there but um yeah i mean that a anything that we do it's tied to that um that concept of you can always see the source document so also one thing to note is like right now our customers are mostly litigators but we do actually have um trust and estates folks who use um clear brief because of our hyperlinking our instant you know hyperlinks so that you could drag in all of your documents, um, let's say, you know, your different trusts or things that you've prepared over time for a client and make, you know, like an organized, um, clickable, secure chart for that where they could download them themselves. So we're trying to, um, yeah, think about how we can also better serve those, um, the corporate side of the firms that we work with. So, Jackie, uh, we ask all of our guests our crystal ball question toward toward the end of the interview. So uh, I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball, peer into the future for us. And what kind of changes or challenges do you see on the horizon? We we typically say the next two to, to five years, but I, I'm thinking maybe more six to, to nine months to maybe a year. What What kind of changes are you seeing on the horizon? Yeah, I think um, the biggest changes are going to be around how law firms train their teams. Um, and there's, you know, a changing of the guard that happens every like decade, I think, or um, where the leadership of, um, you know, our legal institutions, the law firms, the courts, um, the government, everything is, you know, changing. We, we're having um, digital natives, millennials, and and beyond um, enter positions of leadership, and they really want to see radical changes in how law firms are run and how our courts operate. We want to have our profession feel like it's a modern profession. Um, and yeah, I went to a really interesting um, conference a couple months ago. It was the Appellate Court Clerks Conference. And um, one of the speakers um, 
uh, Justice uh, McCormick, um, she was talking about how the she showed an image of a courthouse from like 100 years ago <laughs> and a courthouse of today. And she showed an image of a hospital 100 years ago and the hospital today. <laughs> One looks the same, <laughs> which is the courts. Um, so what's wrong modern. with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> like, we can, um, you know, we can imagine a profession that is, you know, more responsive, um, you know, to the legal needs that people have. And um, I think there was there was some discussion at CleoCon. This happened, you know, last couple of days. And I heard um, Jack Newton's speech about there's I think he said there was like three trillion dollars. Check fact check me on that of <laughs> of, um, you know, sort of latent um, legal needs that are currently unmet. So I think what we're going to see is that um, the changing yeah. of the guard is going to happen. There's going to be technology um, embedded in every aspect of practicing law. And so what I think the leaders of today should be thinking about is how do we um, best empower our, our law students? How do we best empower our um, support staff, our new associates, all the way up to the partners to lead in this new profession and in embracing technology versus just waiting and seeing what others are going to do first. I think that is a mistake. Um, now is this is like a really, really exciting sea change in legal. And we're we're just starting to see um, you know, what's going to unfold in the next decade. I like Justice McCormick's uh <laughs> view, because that really does stand out and you can you can think about it. You can go through the through a town the court square is still the same. The hospital on the edge of town is all of a sudden the modern miracle uh, or marvel uh, in the in in the city. So, um, yeah, I think we've got there some are catching cool up to things do. about that. You know, our our system, you know, does still allow for that due process, and we you know we have the ability to confront witnesses. You know, and <laughs> there's things that are enduring that should stay the same, but you know, we need to also embrace modernity. <laughs> That that is so true. Well, Jacqueline Schaefer, the CEO and founder of Clear Brief AI, I want to thank you very much for coming in and joining us today. This has been really enjoyable. Thank you so much for having me. Great thoughtful questions, and you know, thanks for um, you know exploring technology and um, legal products for for your audience. And thank you to all of you, our audience, for taking the time to listen to the Geek and Review podcast. If you enjoy the show, share it with a colleague. We'd love to hear from you, so reach out to us on social media. I can be found on LinkedIn at Gabe Bauer M on Twitter. Oh, let me do that again. I can be found on LinkedIn at Gabe Bauer M on Twitter and at mgaybauer66 on threads. Comm commas matter in the law commas and matter. podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> and I can be reached on LinkedIn and at Glambert on Twitter and Glambert Pod on Threads. So, uh, Jacqueline, if somebody wanted to learn more and reach out, uh, where's the best place to find you online? Well, they can actually just always email me at Jackie S at clearbrief.ai. <laughs> Um, to get a, you know, a demo of ClearBrief or check it out. You can also just um, go to the Microsoft store and you'll find ClearBrief in the Microsoft um, App Source store. Um, you can start using it and playing around with it today. Um, and also I'm on LinkedIn in Twitter. And I, I post most often on LinkedIn. So um, just look. How, how, did, we, how did our research not find out about the Microsoft store thing, Marlon? Yeah, how did we not? I don't know. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, research that's one of the best the ways. Um, yeah. They just go right in and start. We we make it easy for people to just try it out and start using it today. Very cool. That is cool. Uh, and as always, the music you hear on the show okay. is from Jerry David DeSica. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. All right, Marlene, I will talk to you later. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.